be a systems guy in the Navy, and uh, no one had ever figured out how to bounce uh, Navy tactical data over a satellite. I didn't know that. And so my boss asked me, can we do it? And I was in Libya at the time, and I said, well, sure, let's try it. And so me and this other guy figured it out, and we got this thing bouncing across the satellite, and got everything working quite well, and thought it was just kind of a you know, just interesting patch to do, and then all of a sudden we got this big hubbub about it. Like, you did that? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And then like I thought it was a trouble, and then um, I wound up getting a Navy commendation medal for it because no one had ever done it before. So that was actually pretty cool. Um, all right, so um, that that's all right. So that's a good introduction to me. So I'm a hacker <laughs> from way back. Um, so let's talk about that subject, me. So what about me? Why am I, why am I relevant about Cassandra? So um, I am Principal Solution Architect at DataStax. So that's a cool title, which means I get to hang out with users all day and talk about cool stuff that they're doing. And I do that a lot. Um, I'm doing that today and I'm doing that tomorrow. Some of you have heard me talk all day. Sorry, you can hear me talk some more. Um, but really, it's this is a cool time to have this job because um, Cassandra is really moving fast. There's a lot of things happening, and a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to use it. A lot of new projects, and so that's what I get to do, which is really cool. I get to talk about these new projects and how to get old projects working. And things like that. So, um, DigStacks, of course, is the Cassandra company, and by that I mean we hire most of the committers, um, the Apache committers. That's the Apache side, and they work for us, and so we give them food and clothing and a place to live, and they don't have to live out on the streets, which a lot of people think open source is all about, right? You know, if you're an open source developer, that means you're poor and you're living in a hostel somewhere. No, no. Um, so I've been using Cassandra since point seven. I want to say point six, but no one was really using it in point six. Um, so before that, I was a chief architect at Hobson's, which is an education company, um, and I. Before that, I, I had my own software services company. I did a lot of Java programming. Um, and if you like Twitter, which who doesn't, you can follow me there. I have a lot of followers who like to hear my interesting quotes about Cassandra Badness. And I, I know a lot about that. So that's enough. <laughs> so um, as I said, you know, so DataStacks is all about um, supporting Cassandra, but we also do a lot more than that. Um, we support customers with using Cassandra. And that's really kind of where we started. Um, having a professional company behind open source is kind of the red hat model, right? Is everything that we build is basically open source. And there are some parts that are proprietary, it's just glue. But it's kind of funny, you know, we talk to people like, wait a minute, do you give away your product? Yeah. <laughs> But there's, it's okay. <laughs> but the support element is really important for a lot of companies, so that's what we provide. Um, we also do consulting, and that's what I do a lot of. And we have our data stacks enterprise product. So we also do beer. <laughs> oh, there's some in the back. <laughs> and cupcakes. Now, I put cupcakes on here. We didn't bring any. Um, <laughs> and it's too bad. Um, so maybe next time, you know. But the, the, Cupcakes and beer, I put the question mark there, it doesn't really work. So I think the pizza thing was much better. Um, but yeah, we had we had one of our marketing people um, did a bunch of these Sea Star cupcakes, and we brought them to a Netflix meetup. And everyone's like looking at their beer and their cupcake, like, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to do the, the quick blurb about data stacks, and then we're going to dive into Cassandra. Um, data stacks Enterprise. Of course, is what gives me gainful employment and also provides enough money for to hire great um, great minds at Cassandra and our computers. So what we're doing is we're trying to leverage Cassandra at its core. And when we talk about Cassandra, um, all of these things come up. We talk about velocity of data, your volume of data, the variety of data, complexity of data, and there's a lot of complex data out there, and distributing that around the globe. And that's really what Cassandra. Is all about that's my network. So, what we are doing is we're um, we're trying to provide all these little cool things along with it. One of those is, for instance, Op Center. Like 
managing Cassandra is difficult unless you have a plan because you never deploy just one, you deploy a lot. And so OpCenter is one of our products that we sell and that helps you manage a cluster of Cassandra servers. And so, and that can be very uh, important because like I said, you're not gonna do just one, but sometimes this is the kind of help you need. Um, things like backups, deployment, um, monitoring, all those things are done through there. Um, but we're also, um, I'm just gonna skip over this, but we're gonna go way into that. We also layer Hadoop on top of Cassandra for <coughs> analytics. And when, I'm not gonna go to, I'm just one slide on this topic, but um, this is one of the things that makes data stacks enterprise kind of interesting, is that Cassandra itself is very good at a lot of things, but one of the things it's not good at it is doing huge batch ETL, or uh, analytics, sorry, not ETL, analytics. So Hadoop was, of course, that works, right? Isn't that right, Mr. X Yahoo? So, um, that's right. <laughs> So whenever we put Hadoop on top of Cassandra, it just leverages a lot more of what we're already storing. It gives you a lot better data model technique. So you can say, use Mahout or Scoop. Better yet, use Hive, which looks like SQL. Um, but that's on top of Cassandra column families. And then we also, which is probably one of our more popular parts of this data stack enterprise, is putting Solar on top of Cassandra data. So when we put Solar on top of Cassandra, um, notice these are all Java projects. Um, and all Apache projects. <laughs> um, what we're doing is we're indexing, we're creating these big inverted indexes right on top of Cassandra data. And so the column families that store Cassandra data are indexed in near real time so in our team. And, and so as data is going into Cassandra, it's being indexed by Solar in the way that Solar likes to index it. So things like text search or keyword searches, that sort of thing. Um, but it, it interoperates. So you can do take your data in at speed with Cassandra, process it with Hadoop, and then index it with Solar, which is always cool. So, <clears throat> we could do um, some of these really interesting, these are one of our demos, but this is the kind of the thing that people do with that, that type of mixture of technology is, you know, technology um, for the right thing. So that we were talking about this beforehand, is you gotta pick the right thing for the right problem. Cassandra's awesome for, we gotta do things quickly really fast, right? you're talking thousands and millions of rights per second. But what happens whenever you need to figure out your portfolio? Well, that's where Hadoop comes in better. And if you need to do exploratory searching, Solar comes in better. So right tool for the right job. And we'll just kind of mix through this. So <coughs> like things like these history loss tables are all about grabbing lots and lots of data and then rolling it up. That's where Hadoop comes in. That's why we did Hadoop on top of Cassandra. So whenever you write, um, you can write Hive jobs just like you would an SQL job right on top of Cassandra data. This, I'm gonna create a new Cassandra table by selecting out of other tables stored in Cassandra. And so <clears throat> these, these rich data models are enabled by using what's already built in it. Same boy, I got a lot of these. Okay, so let's talk about where Cassandra came from. So, Cassandra was has two roots really. The first one I would like to talk about is Dynamo. The Dynamo paper at Amazon, um, kind of the beginning of it all. In 2007, Amazon was trying to figure out how to make their databases online all the time around the world because they like money. And they're not online all the time around the world, they're not making money. So what they figured out was a scheme that wasn't just, like they didn't just dream up this one thing. They actually stored, there's I think five people on the paper or four, and <clears throat> they took a lot of different technologies, a lot of different academic papers, and kind of congealed it into this one thing called Dynamo. Amazon now sells a, a product called DynamoDB. It's an incarnation of that paper, but it's, it's a key value store. Key value stores are good for a lot of things, but they're not very good for data mining. When the original Cassandra was built, it was actually built with Dynamo with Big Table sitting on top. Big Table is one row, a ton of columns, like two billion. And that is where Cassandra is, is like a hybrid of those two things. Um, it started at Facebook, I think that's a famous story now, um, and it was open source to the Apache Software Foundation, 
And it was just Avinash that was doing it at Facebook. And at the time, it really wasn't going very far. So it got picked up at Rackspace. And that's actually where the story really starts. Because <coughs> Rackspace is where a guy named John Vanellis was. And he's now the, the chair for Apache, the Cassandra Committee, or the uh, Cassandra Project at Apache. And he's our CTO. He and the other co-founder, David Sachs, said, wow, this Cassandra's really cool. Let's start a company. <laughs> <laughs> because there's people out there using it and they need support. So that's where Data Sachs came from. So that was around the point four days. And since then, Cassandra's been pretty much, it's not even any of the same code that was originally put in the Apache project. It's just been completely redone. I, I mentioned point six was kind of like a dark days moment. It was a lot of things, a lot of technical debt got paid off when we went from point six to point seven. And point seven is really the entire um, and then into 1.0, that's where it really picked up because that's where a lot of what enterprise customers needed, things like low level isolation. But it's fast moving. This is one of the fastest moving projects in the Apache ecosystem. Um, it's constantly being updated, and there are tons of upgrades. So we went from 1.0 to 1.2 in just a year. It's amazing. Okay. What is this all about? So Cassandra is all about this shared nothing concept. There is no master. There is no uh, failover. There is no um, slave lag or any of that. So here's my cluster. These are all different nodes. They, they share information <coughs> with each other. They talk to each other. They act as a cluster and they coordinate. But each one of these is independent from each other. So when a client writes to a node, like my whiteboard, <laughs> uh, when a client writes to a node, it can write to any node. The client has a list of all the nodes, or it can discover all those nodes, but any node can accept information for the entire cluster's worth of data. So if this node was to go down, this <coughs> node can take those writes, or this node, or this node, it doesn't matter. So what I'm showing here with all these squiggly lines in between is how we maintain your cluster being online by replication, and that's the replication factor over here. The replication is not as much of a foreign concept now because a lot of technologies use this now. But this is really what is core to Cassandra, is that when you store data here, it's gonna replicate here and here if you have a replication factor of three, so three copies of your data. Three copies of your data gives you a pretty reasonable assurance that you're gonna have that data when you need it. Um, when, if you were to lose a node, you still have two out of three that have that exact copy of that data. And that's important because I guarantee you, you're gonna to wanna to reboot that node sooner or later. So one of the things that brought me to Cassandra, I've, I've been working at DataStacks for about seven or eight months now. And before that, I was a customer of DataStacks, but I was also a Cassandra user. And what brought me there was I was tired of maintenance windows. And it really was because we were using a relational database and if we needed to change the schema or we needed to reboot the server or we had a patch, we, we had to negotiate all these things. Well, this type of architecture eliminates that need. You don't need to negotiate downtime because you can take these offline and it's okay. Um, we actually, in our op center product, we have a thing called a rolling restart, which is just it walks through your entire cluster and restarts servers when you need them to. It's a normal operation and it's zero downtime. We don't say high availability, we say continuous availability. You really don't want your system to go down ever. We've had people upgrade from 0.7 to 1.2 and never had a moment of outage. That was cool. <laughs> you have something to say about that, Chris? <laughs> okay, so what about the replication? And this is keep saying, this is one of my favorite features, the coolest feature, is a replication. It's a first class thing. If I can replicate my data inside the data center, um, this is what I want to do. I want to replicate that across the country. So why can't I have active-active? And that's okay. This is what I got here. This is active-active. So I have a client on the west coast, and a client on the east coast, and they're both streaming data. This is all one data set, one, one set of data one cluster of data. 
even though they're east coast, west coast, they're replicating data. The data is very efficiently copied from um, data center to data center because the standard is data center aware. So with, and this goes back to the Delano <coughs> paper, Amazon has a lot of data centers around the world. And they know that in order to keep getting money, they need to make sure that they're never down, no matter where you are in the world, putting a transaction into the system. Hey, I want that really cool tennis racket. <laughs> and okay, so that's a good story here. Well then, all of this has been built around that concept, and, and I think it really works for everybody. Because that's all what we, you know, anymore, we live in this always on world. You know, <coughs> I got my cell phone, I got my laptop, I mean, I do web things. I mean, I depend on all this stuff now for my daily life, you know? I, I do my banking on my phone. You know, having downtime and outages just isn't cutting it anymore. And I, sure, you can have outages. Twitter built a business on it. <laughs> but um, and they, but they, they had a fail whale, and that was cool, right? <laughs> the fail whale's cool. But you don't have to do that. And so this is technology, this kind of technology is properly applied keeps you from having to have that moment. So what I keep telling people is, Cassandra is all about this. This is, they, we've eliminated some hard parts. You know, whenever you're looking at transactional, relational databases and like, oh, well, you know, that's kind of comfortable and it's warm and it's like going home, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I know how to do the data model. And then I look at Cassandra, it's scary. Uh, but then what you have is you have this situation where it's one server. And this is what I always spent so much time as chief architect Hobson's doing was, all right, so I have one server. All right, how am I going to keep my uptime up going? Okay, maybe I could shard my data. Ooh, that's bad. And then we're going to have to change my application. And it's just really hard to try to duplicate that much data coast to coast. Well, I got log shipping, but I could buy Golden Gate. That's really expensive. All these things are the hardest things to figure out, not the data model. But now, this has become the easy part. This is the easy button. Now we just need to figure out the rest. And that's what I spend my day helping people to figure out. So, what about that? Why is this cool? <laughs> so the other thing that's really cool about working with a system that's been built around this concept is the amount of performance you get out of it. So if you're a shared nothing, the way the Dynamo was built, and then we've mathematically proven this over and over and over again, is that it's linear scaling. Because each node is responsible for a small piece of the data. And as you add more nodes, they're responsible for less and less of the data, even though you may have a greater aggregate of so, you want more write throughput? You add a node. More read? Add a node. So, it's all linear, and this has been proven many, many times. So, yeah, there's the Netflix benchmark, which was one of my favorites. You could have Netflix here, you could ask them. <laughs> million writes per second. In reality, they do about 1.2 million writes per second on their uh, login cluster all day long. So, how can they do that? Just add enough nodes. They're in Amazon, so add a little extra. <coughs> <laughs> so, this is the kind of scaling that we, this is not me. It was really cool. The first time I gave this presentation was in Toronto, right across the street from the University of Toronto. This is where it was done. <laughs> <laughs> and what they did is they took all these different da databases and pitted them against each other for workloads. And this is done with YCSB. You can go download that. And, but this isn't a big surprise. And everyone says, well, you know, you probably gamed it. Or, but no, it's, this is just the way it was supposed to work. They're just proving that the Dynamo paper was true. And I ran it, so uh, Dr. Uh, Vogel is one of the, Werner Vogel, who's the CTO of Amazon, um, was one of the guys who built this. And I ran into him at the Amazon conference last in October. And he's very happy about this kind of stuff because he did some work on this and it proved his point. Even though we're kind of a competitor, eh, <laughs> not really. But this is this is proof that what they came up with works. And so this is adding nodes, and you get this linear scale. So that worked. So and that's what I hope a lot of you might consider whenever you think about well, I need to potentially I need to scale. Now your needs may be here for today, but what happens whenever you're <coughs> application goes crazy or you know you get a bunch more users or a new requirement and you need to be here oh, okay just add that many servers it's really when you get into a good 
when you you have good harmony with your hardware and your <coughs> operations people, <laughs> then um, <laughs> sorry, because I'm not thinking. Um, that's whenever you can say, well, I need, I'm going to have 20% more load next year. I'll just add 20% more servers. That's kind of cool. Instead of, I don't know, call Dell or HP and get the biggest box they got. <laughs> I did that call. And then they promptly gave me tickets to some big thing. Thanks, man. <laughs> OK, so what is, where is Cassandra in the world of theorem? So you know, like ACID is a relational database, right? And that is the uh, availability Idempotent durability. So we've all had that burned into our brain. MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, Sybase, whatever. It has acid. So Cassandra is based on a different theorem, which is CAP. So that's consistency, availability, and partition. So unfortunately, you get to pick two. And so what Cassandra picks is the availability, so max uptime, as in all the time, and being able to de deal with and a partition is, <clears throat> these nodes can't see each other. A partition event is, say, like the WAN link gets cut between two data centers that are active active. That's hard to survive, right? Because when you're using, say, slave failover, like in MySQL, you can cut that WAN link, you're rebuilding. And that, that other system is offline because it's, it's no longer connected to the master, so it's not getting updates. It doesn't work. That's because it's acid. That's just I mean, that's not bad for that because that's what it is. But CAP puts a different thing in here. We're saying we want to be able to partition our data. And partitioning data it means that I'll survive data centers not seeing each other for a certain amount of time, which means you need to have a plan. And the plan is how to manage your data once they can see each other again and resolve that thing. I'll talk about that in a minute. The consistency is probably where I get dinged on the most about the commander. Oh, isn't that eventually consistent? Like, you know, did the data show up like next week on a bus? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way that it's supposed to work. <laughs> it is eventually consistent because whenever you have systems that are apart and you partition them, it, yeah, there, there's no consistency between those. Okay, you got me. But sometimes that's okay because your availability is up. I mean, and you can build your applications around this fact. But if you absolutely have to have consistency, you can dial that up. That's why I say it sometimes could live there. We have tunable consistency. So if that knob needs to get turned all the way to 11, you can do it right there. So that means you can't do a partition anymore. But if that's what your application needs, then that's what your application needs. All right. uh, so continuous availability. Not, it's much, much better than high availability. And that's where we keep talking about is this <coughs> continuous availability means you shouldn't ever, ever have downtime. Um, so there's some pretty funny tweets up there. But these are real. It actually didn't even put mine up there <laughs> before I had a customer. I, I had a, yeah, I was telling some people this today. I had an outage. Uh, it, there was an outage in Amazon, another one. And I didn't know until I came in on Monday morning. Like a standard cost was fine. Well, it wasn't fine. It was degraded because I had one node missing. But I didn't notice the application was fine. It just, just kind of moved around the problem. But that's what we want, right? We don't want, oh my god, Oracle went down, call in everybody. We're going to be here until it's fixed. That's what's going to happen, right? So I, I put up here this kind of terse. Infrastructure will fail. Of course it will fail. Right? How many in here have had no failure in their infrastructure? That's what I thought. <laughs> because it happened. I mean, they put mean time between failure on everything. Because it's insurance that they're gonna say, well, even a switch has, you know, a stupid little switch has a mean time between failure. Everything fails. So <clears throat> in order to manage that many nines, you've got to put as much you gotta put as much against those nines as you can. And that's what we're trying to do. Let's talk about the end. Because this is where this is where the rubber meets the road. Okay, got all that. The operation stuff, even if you completely believe me, you're probably gonna give me a hard time about, well, how do you get that data in there? So let's talk about data model. <clears throat> this is the first question I get to whenever we talk about Cassandra. What's the data model? I don't understand. Where is that gonna fit my my data is really important. I need to be able to find a place to put it. So let's talk about that. It's not so bad. 
Um, so here are the big concepts. The cluster, as we talked about those, those little nodes in the picture. The cluster is all these nodes working together. And so over the WAN, in the local data center, wherever you want to do it, it's good. The key space is this logical, these are actual words that we use in the data center. The key space is this collection of column families, and it stores all the replication strategies. So if you want a replication factor of three, just plain, it will just keep it all in one spot. If you want to have different replication factors for different data centers, you can have three in one, two in the other, five in one, and one in the other, however you want to do it, but that's stored in the key space. The column family, that's where the business gets done. That is your table, more or less, and that's where it stores the data. And this is a really a lot of data. Um, so if whenever you're storing data here, uh, this is where big table resides. This is your row with a lot of columns. Okay, so how does that work? <coughs> so the row key, which is the, the rows are really where we start here with our inside our column family, is the row key is like your primary key. It's unique, it's indexed, and so what we do is whenever we whenever you provide a row, like some sort of a data for a row key. It's immediately hashed and then turned into a ten, 2 to the 127th number, which I say 2 to the 127th because that's easier than whatever that number is. Um, it's really, really big. But so it creates this hash of this, of this key and then it randomly assigns it to a node inside your cluster. And it's somewhat random, but it's picked by the partition. So th these are more advanced topics. If you want to hear more, I'll tell you more, but after. <laughs> um, but it's also indexed. So whenever we store data in Cassandra, the first thing we add is the row. Here's, I'm gonna put some data in a row, a row key, and I have some examples for we'll show about that. So the next step in this is our column. So we have a, one row key, and we can have up to two billion of these things. I have that up here. So the column name, so we can have, here's one row, tons and tons of you know, like this, this goes like into like Arizona. But um, so you have the first part is a column name. So you have a row and a column name. That's what sets your data. Your data is the column value. So the column name can be a 64K. It's a byte array. And the byte array means that there's no strong typing on that. There's validation classes, but there's no strong typing. We don't really say, well, that has to be a string. That has to be a timestamp. No, no. You get to pick that as part of how you set up your data model, but it is on the disk a byte array. And then the column value could be up to two gigs. Well, don't do that though. Because <laughs> setting two gigs of data takes a long time on the, the wire. So, but you could do it. <laughs> the next thing is the timestamp. Now this is critical, because the timestamp is set by the client, and as I talked about ad nauseum today, make sure you sync your clients, because this is a very important thing inside your data. The timestamp is what really regulates like who wins in a, in a eventually consistent model. So if we have a partition event and we have two data centers of Cassandra talking or getting data, and then all of a sudden you get a lot of data in one and then not and then some in the other, and they're maybe the same data, whenever they come back together, they're gonna have to be checking each other. They're gonna be doing the bookkeeping operation between the two data centers. How they resolve conflicts is with timestamp. The last one in wins. That's just the way it works. And that's probably what you're looking for anyway. Think about time series data. You want to be able to get all that data in, but if you're setting the same column name with a greater timestamp, that should be the one that wins. Now, the secret power of the column is the TTL. And the, the, the hero of the column is the TTL. And that is literally the expire time of this particular column. And it sure that sounds interesting, but it really is cool. Because that means that whenever you put data in your database, you can say when you want it to disappear. And that actually does work. Because whenever you set the TTL to say 10 minutes, or an hour, or 30 days, or 60 days, really what you get is a self-cleaning database. Because a lot of data models that I work with with customers, it has to do with storing uh, data that is transient. Um, I have a customer that they, they store 250 terabytes of log data every month, but they expire it every month. So that's a lot of data coming and going. 
how they don't have one single background job that runs in the background and cleans up 250 terabytes of data. To do that, it would be enormous. What they do is they just put a 30-day timestamp on there, and it just drops it up. And it's part of a background cleanup that runs, in, it's more internal than Cassandra, you probably want to know right now. But that, that timestamp is honored. That TTL is honored. Really cool whenever you have a lot of different data models. You can even partition your data. You can set the same data in two places, in <coughs> two column families. One is more of an archive, where you may have a lower replication factor, but that TTL set to a year. And then have like a hot data one that only has 30 days or maybe a, a 10 day window on it. So then that data is really stored tight and it's even replicated a lot more. So you can mix and match and do different things with your data model. Like that. And of course, the columns are dynamic. It's not fixed schema. You don't have to fix the schema. You just, if you say, here's a row key, here's a column name, it will add it to this column name. Okay. So, two billion columns. That's and not a practical limit, <laughs> but you could do it. And that's another one, like two gigs of data in a column. And it's really cool whenever you know, you're, you're breaking out stats, like, oh yeah, my car will go 200 miles an hour. Have you ever done that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we could do two million columns. <laughs> but just the fact that you could. Um, the practical limits are really around uh, how much data you can store on a disk and, or one machine. You can't span machines. Um, with one row. So if it doesn't, all that data doesn't fit on one machine, then of course you can't go with that one. Um, but there's also other considerations, like do you really want to go through two billion columns? Um, you could. <laughs> but the important thing is that there's no scheme. So it's schema free, but it's, well, it's schema like. You can do schema if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, think of time series data, where you have a, a sensor ID, and then you have timestamps of all the different times it took temperature measurements. Well, that's a random amount of things. Well, that's a great uh, that's a great description of how you would store data in a column family like this, is that you may have you know, 300 time readings today, but tomorrow you may have 1,500. Well, okay, you can store those each in a different column or a different row. And it, you don't know how long it's gonna be? Well, it doesn't matter. You don't have to preset those up. Um, I know with Oracle, you know, you get 1,024 columns and then you fall off the face of the earth. Well, no problem here. So um, the, uh, the column add and all that are about just adding it when you put this mutation into the system. So when it goes into the system, it's also sorted. And it's sorted by a comparator. So whenever you give it a column name and you say your comparator is UTF-8 or basically um, what you're doing is you're sorting that data on in memory as the data goes in. It sorts it, does a merge sort, and then puts it on the disk in a sorted fashion. So let's say that you're sorting things by time or by name. Well, that's going to get pre-sorted on the disk. So whenever you ask for a column name, there's this concept of getting a slice of data. So you say, here's, I'm sorry, this is row name. I'm going to give you a row key, and I need a slice of data. Well, if I say I want to slice from column three to column six, just kind of an arbitrary value, that's a sequential read off the disk. So one row key, sequential read off the disk, that's a really fast access pattern. You're going to one node and you're getting a lot of data really fast because it's all coming right off the disk. This is why Cassandra is really fast. And this is why you can do millions of these in a, in a second. So, um, this kind of data access pattern is prevalent in a lot of the data modeling that I do. Okay, so uh, how do we get to our data? What's the API? Now, after we take a break, um, so I have, I have two parts to this. One of them is really kind of like this, hey, here's Cassandra, yay, go team. And then the second part is um, I'm gonna talk about our latest version of Cassandra, some of the new stuff, and also our new Java driver. So some of this, I'm just gonna kind of wave my hand a little bit, but we're talking. We're gonna talk about our Java driver after this. But so, the in the beginning, the way to get to Cassandra, which I think turned a lot of people off, was Thrift. Has anybody done Thrift before? See, yeah. I've yeah. seen it. Job. C++ yeah. Things. Yeah, exactly. And you have to compile a C++ with a boost library. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's why this is going away. <laughs> oh man, anybody who's in Thrift and the Standard community just heard me talk bad about this. 
you want to start a good fight on the Cassandra IRC, go in there and say, Thrift is dead! <laughs> <laughs> and then run away. <laughs> Matt is going to be the first one to pounce on you. What's that? Matt's going to be the first one to pounce on you. <laughs> you know, I've had this argument coming up. So, um, yeah, one of the other solution architects, Matt Dennis, he's, he's an old school Thrift guy. And I'm a little less that, and we get into arguments all, all the time about this. But that's what's fun about open source. We can talk about this openly. Everyone gets to see how the sausage is made. Um, so thrift it really actually had good reasons for thrift because it was very thrift is that it was a protocol buffer, protobufs from Google kind of re reimagined in Facebook, and it's very good at putting a lot less data across the wire. The only problem is is it requires you to bundle things up and then send it in one shot. So if you have a lot of data, it's got to grab all the data and then send it in one. No such thing as streaming or anything like that. So, um, but that's where most of the clients, if, if you've ever used um, Cassandra right now, like up to now, you're, you're using Thrift with Hector or Astyanx as the Java driver. Uh, Astyanx is the Netflix driver. Um, those are using Thrift. Um, so the, the future is CQL. It's Cassandra query language. And CQL, um, you know, is new and shiny and Thrift is the old one, but the thing that I really like about CQL is we're getting away from this driver, this wire protocol, and moving to a CQL binary protocol, which is our own protocol across the board. So it opens up a lot more doors for like streaming and things like that. But the language, the query language, is much better for describing how to do model your data. Thrift was a little difficult. Um, it took some learning, and it, there was unfortunately a lot of ways to abstract it in graphs and graph paper and chalkboards and whatever else. But CQL is an expressive language, it's DMF, it looks just like SQL actually. But um, that's where we're headed. It's, um, as of 1.2 it's been finalized, and the Cassandra 1.2, but Thrift isn't gonna go away anytime soon. <laughs> Can't have that. And, um, Unless we start a civil war. Uh, but Thrift is, is going to always be around. I mean, it's backward compatibility for legacy reasons, etc. The newer functionality, though, is going to be a civil war. All right, so the CQL war. So this is probably one of the biggest things on CQL, which I agree with completely. So what's funny is Eric Evans, who was one of the guys at Rackspace who was behind Cassandra, was the guy who tore, coined the term no sequel. Yeah. So thanks, Eric. Yeah. And if anyone's ever met him, you'd be like, you'd understand. He's kind of a graph dude. No sequel. Uh, I don't need that. Well, what did he do? I guess he got a guilt complex because he was the first guy to come up with CQL. <laughs> <laughs> so when he was working at Rackspace, he came out with this point eight version because he's like, well, this is kind of hard to get to. I think SQL was kind of cool. So um, <laughs> he came out with. CQL, and that was available in point eight. That was really the first version, um, a lot like the first pancake. You know, you get this down. So, version two was out in 1.0, and that really was it was meant to be kind of an adjunct to the CLI, but it quickly became known and understood that this is some this is the way forward because so many people wanted to just gravitate to this data modeling language. So. Uh, as of 1.1, we had a uh, we had CQL3. Yeah, that's three versions and three versions. Um, mm. But uh, that was the beta version, and then it was finalized, and the API was finalized in 1.2. I, I think it's it's definitely gotten much better because, and I, I, I did a lot of participation in that final cut because I was using it quite a bit to do data modeling and found a lot of things that I didn't like. So that's part of the community process, though. So. Um, CQL, like I said, is really where we're headed. And to really push that, the data stacks drivers, which I'm going to talk about quite a bit, which you guys will see a lot more than anybody else has, preview, uh, is all about CQL. So let's talk a little bit about the data model and like how would you build data. So this is this is where we're going to get into some cool stuff, right? So um, this may be repetitive for some people. <laughs> so um, let's start with just a fixed schema. So I have my user tables. So it's like, <laughs> like this is CQL three, not CQL two. You saw the CQL three. So 
whenever you create schema, you can go back to your relational model pretty easily by creating fixed schema, but that's fine. I mean, there's plenty of uses for just having an entity inside Cassandra. This is a user. Um, if anyone's ever seen any of my other data modeling talks, I talked about my video database, uh, killervideo.com. Um, <laughs> this complete data model will be in a book coming out in about a month, so you're getting a preview on that too. So um, the, uh, this is just a, a standard user table. This is CQL3. This looks really familiar, right? This is, this is nice, it's a little homey. This is not, this is CQL3. So here is my, here's all my fields. Um, here's my types, and today I heard it for the first time. Why is there no, no, like number there? There's what? There's no size. And that was the first time I heard that. But um, yeah, there's no size because there's no size. <laughs> you put in as much data as you need. Uh, relational databases pre-allocate that space. You know, they, whenever you say I want a bar chart two fifty five, it says okay, got that. Well, that means that you're going to have a DB file. It's, you know, how many people have created a, you know, a MySQL database and said, okay, here's my schema, and all of a sudden you get like a two gig file. What happened? <laughs> well, it's pre allocating all that space for everything that needs to do. Cassandra is much different, <clears throat> it's very sparse. So it says, hey, guess what? I only need what I need. So you just, it's going to be a, a bar chart, and this is only for validation. It has nothing to do with what's actually stored on the disk, it's validation. So. In this case, I have a lot of bar charts, but I have a timestamp here. If I tried to throw like a username or you know a number, one number like the number one here, because it's validation, it's going to say, uh, no, 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 that's not a timestamp. I don't know what you're doing. But that's the only time that it really cares. When you look at the disk, the only thing that it is is, is a binary. That's all it is, and it's 15 bytes of overhead for the row, for the column, and then the rest is just the data. That's the size. So there's actually, I can show you a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet of how to calculate how much data you're going to have on disk based on your data model and how much you have in that. So that's pretty cool. You can calculate a lot of that pretty easily. Okay, so primary key in this case, very simple. That's the row key, username. Um, you can create secondary indexes. Now, what I pointed out very strenuously today, what I'm going to do again, is that secondary indexes are not for speed. They are for convenience. If you think you're going to make your first name look up fast because you created this index, it's not the same index as relational. I really wish we called them something else, like look up enablers or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I lost that one. <laughs> it's not an index like an index that you would do in a relational database where, hey, I'm getting a slow query whenever I do a where clause on this particular field. That's not, and then, oh, I'll add an index. Bam, oh yeah, you've got a fast lookup. That's not what's happening here. This is what this is, is more, it's because this table is very, it, there's no real fixed columns in Cassandra. We have to index all of where those fixed columns would be. And so an index is really just a way to find all this data. If you say, I want to look up first name on users, or first name equals Patrick, that's how you could find it. Index is where all those rows are that have that name in them. But what's funny is I could create a, a row without the word first name. So that's where these indexes get a little funny. That's it has to figure out where all this stuff is. So <clears throat> these are just for convenience. Um, most of my data models, I do not use secondary indexes, just because I found ways around. I, there's not enough convenience for me. But that's what they're there for. But I'm throwing out that as new Cassandra users of where you are. Um, that's why you shouldn't use them, or you should use them. It's not for speed. So what about these one-to-many relationships? Um, this is a eager, this is different, this is CQL3. <laughs> this is a lot easier to work with. I wish I did CQL2. So what about one-to-many? One-to-many relationships are tough in a non-relational database because you're talking about a join condition of some sort usually. Whenever you do a one-to-many, you have your user table and then you're joining it with all these different videos that are in there. Well, okay, that requires a join statement. Select where you know user ID equals video ID or user ID inside here. It's not possible because you can't do a join. So what we do is we do these denormalization techniques. So what I'm saying here in this comments table is that um, comments have many users and videos have many comments. And it's actually many. 
Um, so what I'm doing is I'm denormalizing this username inside the actual data of the video. But when I create my primary key, I create a primary key of video ID and username. So I can index those things properly. So if I need to look up the username or the video ID for a comment or a timestamp, then I can just use either one of those. So you're going to one table. Yes, sir. Sorry. Does primary key keep those unique? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just because index didn't actually do an index before, so I wanted to make sure. Yes. Use the primary key. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you had. I'm glad you had. <laughs> or asked it. Because what you're doing here is you're actually what I'm showing you is a representation. What's actually happening under the covers is something very different. It doesn't look like this. So, but it, you're guaranteeing unique the uniqueness. The primary key is in the video ID, the username, and the time each point was given. So if you do that twice, it's idempotent. It's going to do the same thing, and it'll just overrun the last one. So um, what I'm pointing this out as is this is how we do denormalization. Denormalization means you, you are going to be putting a lot of data together. Now, actually, what this does is it creates a wide table. It's going to have a, a wide, I'm sorry, a wide row. The real representation is the video ID is going to get stretched out this far with all the username and comments. So I'll show you what that actually looks like. What's really happening under the, <laughs> under the covers is that <coughs> it's storing the video ID and it's doing this thing. This is called a compound column. So what looked like a table in the previous example is really using this wide row. So it's compounding the, the video ID, username, and comment. That's the unique part. And then here's the actual comment. So if I, when I do a lookup for a video ID, username, and comment timestamp, I can find the comment. That's the unique part. But the next comment, and the next comment, and the next comment just extend out this row. So, and that's a better data model. If I was creating a bunch and bunch and bunch of rows, that's not a very efficient data model. Because if I wanted to grab, say, all the comments for a particular video, that's going to mean that I'm going to have to go to a lot of different rows and a lot of different nodes. What's more efficient is because we now know that whenever you do a, a access, you're looking by row key, single node. And then whenever I grab all this data in a row, all the columns, that it's a sequential read off of the disk much faster. This is milliseconds, mm -hmm. like single digit milliseconds. So with that going on, you're going to have a lot better access for your website, for your application, your mobile app, whatever <laughs> needs that data really quickly. <clears throat> this is a great data model. Yes? So ordering matter? Ordering so does matter. You have username, timestamp. So if you want to look at all of the comments that happened around a particular timestamp, not necessarily by the same user. With this, Without, all right, so what you could do is you can eliminate the name of the username and just put in the timestamp. That, that would be a, an alternative to that. Say, like, you just wanted to grab a slice of all the time, so you didn't care who said it. So what you could do is grab video ID and timestamp, and then put the username and comment as a value. So you just say, okay, give me all, and then, even better, sort your comparator, use the comment timestamp as a comparator. So now everything is sorted naturally, in memory, and then on the disk, in time order, so that whenever you say, in this video, give me all the comments in order, time order. So think about like your web app, right? And you click on a video and you want to see all the comments underneath it, you're going to have the video ID, and then you grab a slice of all the columns and you get a listing of all the comments underneath it in order. Your application doesn't have to do any of that. It's all just regularly set up on the disk. It's ready to go. The data comes back in the order that you want it. Yeah. But what, what if I want to see the first name and the last name attached to a particular comment? Would that involve the table journal? No. That's another denormalization technique. If your application requires that, put it in here. There's nothing that you can't put it in two places. I, I, I have to design that into the data model to begin with. Right. Or you design it into your application to store that data and initially. Yeah. But that has a presupposition that you know what the query will be. And sometimes you are storing a lot of data because you think it will be useful. You don't know mm -hmm. where it is. And six months later, the BA says, ah, that's the query. That's true. Did we mention the DSE integration with Hadoop? <laughs> yeah, Hadoop. <laughs> yeah. Hadoop, I've fixed a lot of data models with Hadoop. <laughs> a lot of data models with Hadoop. 
because I can do batch analytics. And so with DataStacks Enterprise running on top of this, it's running right on top of the column family. Now that, that's probably an easier way to do it. There, you could also just write a little application code to prove all your data. We talked about this a bit today, um, earlier, which is how would you manage the changes in your data? So if you're changing your data model mid-flight, how would you manage that? Well, first thing you do is you, like you need to have a username and a, uh, the first name and last name. I think that was your example. Like I want a first name and last name in there. All right, well, whenever I grab this, I just get a username, which means that I'm gonna have to, the first time I did this, I said I'm just gonna need username. Well, sure, you can go back and do a second get on username and the user table and get the first name and last name. That, that means you do two gets. That's not that expensive, but let's just say you're really into efficiency and you wanna do this all in one get. And keep in mind, because standard data models sometimes do multiple gets and multiple inserts. They're very cheap, so it's not that hard to do. But let's, let's just try to denormalize this. So in this case, um, my data model's shifted. Now, uh, not only is it common, I need to add first name and last name. So what I do is in my application code, whenever someone puts in a new comment, I, the first thing I do is I say, okay, and include in the comment also the first name and last name from now on. But I don't change my read code yet. Okay. My read code is still going to grab <coughs> the video ID and all these comments and just grab the comment part out and not pull the first name and last name. Then what I can do is then I can go back and I can just write a job to fix all the old data that's already in there and reinsert all that data. Then now I have all my data from past to present in there that's correct and then flip my reader so that it's just pulling the first name and last name right out of this normal if it did change. Um, it's a little more work, but if you notice, I didn't say anything about downtime, and it's still gonna scale. But this is all in flight. You don't have to have any outage to do this. The, the, the same would be true if a uh, user needs to update his first name and the user has thousands of comments already. Then that, that update would have to happen thousands of times. Right, and that's why I probably would stop you from putting your first name and last name inside this data model. <laughs> but then I need to use the name, uh, first name and last name attached to a comment. Well, then you can go grab it from the user table. That's really not that hard. That's a second get. I just have to do one uh, multiple gets. Yes, and that is a uh, multi-get is a is a API call. Um, and when I show you the Java driver, it's a very cheap call. That's why I say doing multiples. So I, I wrote a, a long time ago, I wrote a, an application while I was, I had a couple of things going, but we had a Cassandra-based application that was collecting all of our web calls around the world. And for every web event that came in, we did 90 inserts, because we would dice up our data into all these different types of data models. Like, we had our dashboard, we had our raw data, we had all our 500 errors, and you know, we were collecting all these statistics on all these clicks. We did 90 inserts for every web, web event. We had some pretty, we had some big websites that were getting hit. We were getting thousands and thousands of, of events a second. But I can scale Cassandra to do hundreds of thousands of inserts per second. So that wasn't that expensive to do. I was pre-optimizing my writes so my reads were easier. Now reads, similar story. You usually don't want to do more than one or two reads on an Oracle database because they can be pretty expensive on a join, right? You might get, you know, it might take a few milliseconds to do. Well, with read latencies less than a millisecond for Cassandra, that's not so bad anymore. If you need to do one read and then a second or third or fourth or fifth read, it's not so bad. That's going to fit pretty nicely. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. You talked a little bit about uh, <coughs> schema migration. Um, so is that, when you said you'd have to do uh, some kind of job that would just go yeah. from node to node, is that just available on the Astyanx API? No, that's, uh, that's probably one you build yourself because you need to have a lot more data awareness. Like, what are you trying to move? Like in this case where we want to put a first name and a last name from the right. user table into the video table based on username, there's not a generalized way to do that. You would probably want to write a job code. It's, it, it wouldn't be that hard it would just to run a long time. So, um, I do was a good choice. <laughs> I've done, like I said, those 90 inserts that I was doing, I started with like 75. <laughs> and as we went along, you know, people were like, oh, that's really cool. You know, 
know how to do that. Uh, can we get this on the dashboard? I'll be right back. <laughs> we'll write a hive job, pivot it around, create a new ta data table, push out our Fluent client, boom, it's there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it is not, and this is why I keep saying, is that this isn't the easy, easy button. What we've made easy is the two parts that were possible. But I've spent a lot of time with people where this model starts to fit what their application needs to do. And if you think about what your core requirements are for your application, if it's uptime and performance, which are very, you know, those are paramount. <coughs> Look at the, your data model. Is it really that difficult to do? And if it's totally impossible, then don't use this. But I have yet to find something that was completely hard. Yes. Impossible. Um, doing active back from data centers with Oracle? Impossible. <laughs> I don't care how much money you have. Depends on the problem. Huh? <laughs> Are you going to bring up the exit? Like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. You want to have a question, please? Yes. So even though Cassandra can handle all of these 90 inserts that you do per click or per event, right. or per interface, what about the load on the network itself? So many things are going on between back and forth between the client and the process. <coughs> well, so it's distributed. And this is the part that scales really nicely too, is that whenever the good client is set up, it's aware of all the nodes. So it, it, it can, you can have it set up to do random, you can have it go to specific nodes for different reasons. So there's communication, that communication is distributed as well. It's not all going through like like one of there's several databases that use, but they go through a coordinator a master node. So that, that node has to handle all the traffic for the rest of the cluster. Every node can be communicated with the domain. So that scales pretty well. The communication, because you're only replicating a certain number, like if you have if you have 200 nodes and your replication factor is three, you're still only replicating three times. If you have 1,000 nodes and your replication factor is three, you're still only replicating three times. So that communication scales pretty well. And if you have a thousand nodes and your clients are talking to those nodes, they're going to talk to one of one thousand. So that scales in that regard too. Um, yes, there's a lot of communication, but it's spread out. And in your implementation, what's the, what's the size of these instances you know, in terms of the power of the machine and the memory? What are the sizes for these? Uh, well, I was kind of dumb then. Um, <laughs> I had six M1X largest. Super easy, and um, yeah. So that that was a. I, I say that was kind of dumb because I it seemed like I was always right on the edge of disaster with that because I should have added a couple more nodes. But you know, it was it was fun to try. M one X large is not that big of a node. Sixteen gigs is really kind of a wimpy node. But you know that that just shows you like how much we were doing several thousand writes per second on that. So Cassandra, here's some numbers. These are these are our, our numbers. You can do 4,000 writes per second per core, divided by the replication factor. That's the number. So 4,000 writes per second on, say, a quad core box, you're doing 16,000 writes per second. You divide, if you have a replication factor of two, divide it in 10. So 8,000 writes per second per machine. So if you need to do 16,000 writes per second, you put two of those. So, I mean, that's the kind of math you can do to, to assume. Now, Amazon shaved a thousand off of that because <laughs> those machines were built like when I was in high school. Um, but, <laughs> so we say 3,000 rates per second on Amazon. But that's how you get it. Okay. Um, we need to do a break, so let me finish up this thing. So, all right. The data model um, cannot be complete without me talking about indexing data. And this is another concept that is very specific to Cassandra. So, because you can't do joins, um, you can also, you know, if you do any kind of filtering or you do scans, like you're just looking at every single row looking for data, that can be very expensive, especially if you have two billion rows. So, what we're, what we're doing here is we're creating our own indexes. And yes, this needs to be maintained by your application, but let me explain this. So, my videos all have tags, okay? And my tags could be you know, something like a cat video or a dog video or something like that. But whenever my application requirement is that I need to be able to look up videos by tag, what I can do is create a table like this. I just call it this my tag index. So I have a tag, which would be like cat. 
and then I would just have a list of all the video IDs and timestamps for all the videos that have the word that are tagged with cat. So if I have a user that says, give me all the cat videos, then I just go to one row on one node and grab a slice of all of those the columns that have those videos in them. And when you do that, you get a very close, fast lookup, this is an index lookup, of all the videos with that particular tag. There's no searching, there's no scanning, it's a one-shot deal, because you're doing a row key and a slice. That's the fastest operation I can say. So these kind of tables, I build all the time. And believe me, this is where this is where you can really make your application, is doing this properly. Now, again, this is where this is the, the, the harder part of working with Cassandra. But if this becomes a natural part of your data modeling exercise, which I remember doing a lot of normal tables, oh look, we we're gonna build something really stupid and we just have 25 tables. <laughs> okay, well this isn't that big of a deal. So because we're, we're dealing with this fact that everything has to be fast and indexed, this is the way we do it. And it, it works really well. Question up there? Do you find, um, so say like cat videos were really popular and dog videos were really right. popular. And say they came out to caches that were really close to each other. Um, do you find that you're partitioning your tokens like close to each other? Mm -hmm. Like, or you split them in half? No, the, well, because the hashing is done with MD5, mm -hmm. MD5 will not put something similar to each other, close to each other. I'm just saying, like, uh, if you notice that two different things are like really close to each other, like really popular things, right. they're huge. Um, for some reason, like one and two, um, mm -hmm. do you just like put your tokens smart, or you just start uh, splitting them in half if they're partitioned? You know, you mean like creating a partition of some sort? You are, uh, you're, you're talking about the, the node tokens, yeah. not the, uh, oh, oh, not oh. the data, not data partitioning. The the nodes. Basically having two hot rows on the same thing. Yeah. Right, hot rows. All right, so how to avoid a hot row is you can do some other kind of techniques. All right, so if you're, if you're anticipating that kind of thing, if you potentially could, it's hard to get hot rows with something like this where it's going to be somewhat random, but let's say you do run into that situation. This is where you think about it in your data model is what else can I add to that row key to make it a little more distributed or a little more um, a little more randomized if you want. So like you I think you were alluding to maybe the, the tag and the date or the you know the minute tag or something like that. So then you want to create row keys that have that you can create with data that you already have. So I want to know all the cat videos from a week ago. If you put a date in there, that's gonna be calculated. Say okay, cat, and then you can put in some sort of row keys with different dates. In them. Yes, they're going to be distributed. They're going to walk their way around because of the, the hashes are going to be different. But you can still find them pretty easily too. That's actually a pretty common technique for indexing that I do whenever I have something that's going to be that I know is going to get hammered. You know, it's going to have two billion columns within a week. Okay, start looking for row keys. How, what do you add to the row key to make it a little more partition? Um, dates are awesome. Um, maybe some part of this, like part of the video ID. Um, I heard a good one today, hashing and using a modulus on top of the hash. I mean, we can get into some really cool computer science tricks, so. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, could you elaborate on the last point? Because that is App logic. critical, exactly. It is very critical, yes. <coughs> We're shoving a lot of the, the, the integrity into the app. And that, that's the trade-off. So whenever your, your tags are being maintained not with a referential integrity, that you have now this tag setting in application logic. So if you remove a video with a particular tag on it, you just have to know how to do this. Um, there's some techniques around this. Uh, and I talked a lot of it about this today, about having, like if you have a series of operations that need to occur for a particular, you know, something like whenever I delete a video, these five things need to occur. That's one thing you can create a column family for. It's say, here's the five things, and then whenever those are completed, you mark the column family saying this was done. So it's like a it's like a commit commit lock to those transactions. These five things need to be done. Oh, they weren't. Replay, pick up where I left off. Like for instance, whenever you create a video, you have three or four tables that need to be created. You create a commit log with those. It says I'm doing these things, 
And then part of that video record, one of the fields you put in there is all the transactions were completed. So whenever you grab a video, you verify that everything is intact. And if it says no, you go back to the commit log and replay it. So these are, I mean, you have to do a little more thinking. But, um, and I, I know it sounds onerous, but it's not that bad, actually. Um, we're getting into some, <coughs> some rare examples, but good ones, because it kind of shows you what we can do. And the other, I mean, these are things you have to do in application logic. But again, you're dealing with a distributed database. You're doing this across multiple data centers at ridiculous speed. Small part of the pain. <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, but there are a lot of things built into some drivers that can do this automatically, too. So I figure within a year or two, a lot of what I'm talking about here, like I was saying earlier, is that you're gonna be like, man, I remember Cassandra back in 1.1, man, that was like crazy. We had to create our tokens, and we had to do our indexes, man, that was like walking uphill in the snow. <laughs> man, you guys don't know how good you have it with this new Cassandra. <laughs> Cassandra's moving very fast. Um, wait until you get to 1.2. <laughs> All right, so i am just got a couple of things here um, just to finish off this section. Loading data, how do you get a lot of data in there? Uh, there's a lot of BI tools that support um, Cassandra, um, Talent, Pintaho, JasperSoft. Um, actually, the one that I really like is the Pintaho Kettle. It's open source. Man, you can load a lot of data into Cassandra from a relational database like that. Um, so uh, you can write custom, custom code. That's what I like to do. And then we have our SS table loader, which takes and bulk loads data into Cassandra. And we also have a copy command, which is done on the command line, which is good for you know, less than a million rows, <coughs> which is the next one right here. You can do a copy. So you say, create this copy customers from a, a text file, and then it's just like doing SQL loader. You can load data directly into it. And I use that quite a bit, too, for some data. So all right, stop. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> this is a good time for a break.